Welcome back to the Layman's Law School, where three hillbilly lawyers get together and talk about <laughs> the legal issues of the day. I am your host, Chase Hawk, along with my two illustrious, great and powerful co-hosts, Reed Sanders and Sean Merzlach. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, I Sean. I prefer, I mean, I prefer to you introduce me as the distinguished gentleman. Okay, that's your, is yeah, that your my, preferred that's pronoun? That's preferred pronoun, the, the <laughs> distinguished gentleman. No problem. <laughs> Speaking of distinguished, you know, it is Friday, and Reed always brings a distinguished beverage I I mean, for us to celebrate. Like I said, I reek, I reek of class. He started, yes. he started like a little early. He got a little antsy. Listen, y'all were talking. I just went ahead and popped the top. It's Friday, but I brought y'all one just, just in case. <laughs> I've already got, the you know, the aroma for the room. Go ahead, Chase. This oh, is your favorite you. part of your Friday. It's I know how much you love this. Look at that. I think it has some, <laughs> some juice. juice. <laughs> there you go. How was it? As good as Just as I remember. Just, <laughs> exactly as I remember. Cheers, boys, and happy Friday. Happy, happy Friday. Friday. Yeah. Happy Friday. And see, I'm not the only one that uh, has a disdain for this particular I'm, beverage. As you'll notice, I'm sure. <laughs> Mr. Murray's like, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. have a disdain for it. I just I mean, you know, <laughs> choose other uh, to, <laughs> Ways to hydrate my in another yeah. way. Yeah. He drinks water. Oh, yeah, and yeah water. exactly. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a simple man. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Okay, well, you know, it was an inevitable. You know, we are yeah, here yeah, in yeah. the sort of uh, Georgia, South Carolina, CSRA area, and we have a scandal that has occurred sort of in our backyard. Um, the Alex Murdoch trial has been going on for about nine or ten days now. Never heard of it. Not familiar whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to hear it. And in fact, you know, I've actually had some cases with people that are witnesses in this case, mm -hmm. other other attorneys, because there's all kinds of attorney malfeasance. He was uh, Alex. I'm sure. Murdoch was actually. Uh, I think Reba McIntyre wrote a song about it. The <laughs> night the lights went out in Georgia, they hung an innocent <laughs> no. man and all that. No. no. Was, hey, you don't trust a backwood country lawyer. I think that was part of the song. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think he fits right in here. No, well, aside from <laughs> the innocent part, well, he is innocent well, until proven uh, guilty. There's other a, still, other innocent so, parties. I'm just saying, yeah. uh, maybe. Okay, for those of you that don't know, Alex Murdoch is a uh, a disgraced um, uh, South Carolina attorney that's been disbarred for basically malfeasance uh, with the you know basically embezzling clients' funds through his firm, and he has been charged with the murder of both his wife and his son. That's how you uh, had the lead there, Chase. What's that? Talk about embezzlement, then you go, oh, yeah, he oh, yeah. killed and, people. Well, this is what we're talking about, the trial, not the, I know, the embezzlement. I know, I know, The embezzlement's I know. coming. I he's know, he's actually, in that in that particular case, he's actually been charged with over 90. He did some really bad thing. He yeah. was debarred. Yeah, yeah murder he, will do that to you. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just on the embezzlement part, that's why they got the part of the off with. But, that, I mean, he's got over 90 charges that he's going to be facing with regard to that, just for the number of times that he did it and the amount of money involved. But. Uh, just for the those of you that don't know, uh, Alex Murdoch is being accused of uh, murdering his wife and son on June seventh, two thousand and twenty-one. Some of the facts surrounding the case involve basically around that time, Alex and his wife uh, Maggie were not doing very well. They were living at separate properties, um, and uh, you know, you know, you know, you're doing pretty well if you've got separate properties. You know, the one in Moselle where he asked his wife to meet him. Was this is the vacation area? A couple thousand acres. Uh, yeah. seventeen hundred. Seventeen hundred acres and three point nine million at, as Man, the vacation. Seems, yeah. seems normal. Seems reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Well, he asked her to come out there and meet meet him because they needed to go see his ailing father who was basically dying in the hospital. And Maggie his mother, wasn't it? No, his mother his actually father? has Alzheimer's, right? Okay. But but he he called her out there under the auspices of, of having her go with him to visit his ailing father who was in the hospital. And she knew something was up. I mean, according to the text to her friend, she says, he's acting weird. He's up to something, right, before she even goes out there. And she apparently arrives right at around, you know, 830, 840, and goes down to uh, the dog kennels with her son Paul, the other victim in the case. Um, it's been alleged that right around 850 by the prosecution that both Maggie and uh, Paul were killed, and there's been a... a, a volume of uh, uh you know cell phone evidence that has really come into play in this case as comes into a lot of cases here in the modern area and the cell phones really have changed the game not in just criminal investigations but but also in in uh, civil investigations and in cases in which we're actually investigating uh, 
not only car accidents, but slip and falls, all that type of stuff. But what we're going to do today is talk about some of the hot sort of uh, highlights of, of the first couple of weeks of trial. First of all, have you guys watched any of this or are we going to, are we going to, are you following <laughs> uh, us? I was, I was, you know, pretty heavy into it when, when all of it was initially happening. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess that was, you know, uh, last year, mm -hmm. you know, sometime. Mm -hmm. And it amazes me that the trial is already here. Yeah. Because, you know, there's, you know, plenty of trials, uh, people well, waiting trial here especially in Especially with this mag. They've been in for three and, years, and, four and years. Especially with this amount of evidence sure. that you have to. Um, yeah. right. But I, I watched a lot of the news coverage on it, you know, right when it happened. And especially, you know, up to the point where he was. Uh, allegedly attacked himself and shot in the head, and mm -hmm. after that, I was just kind of kind of washed my hands from it. I was, you know, made yeah. a, a decision in my own mind about what had occurred right. here, uh, and I haven't watched the trial a lot since it's started. Okay, yeah. I, I'll, I'll tell you my background. So I don't know hardly anything about the case mm -hmm. outside of my my lovely and beautiful wife who listens to every podcast or every news outlet that has anything to say about it. And then she wants to describe it to me as soon as I get home from work, which I've done legal work all day. And then she wants to tell me about it. So I don't hear a lot of it. I'll just be, be frank. You know, she, she says a lot of it. I just don't hear a you lot. You catch of it. the buzzword. I guess you'll be enough <laughs> to nod and, and say, man, that's crazy. That's crazy. There you go. <laughs> gotcha. well, I might do that on occasion myself. <laughs> Well, uh, Sean touched upon one thing that I, that I wanted to make sure viewers are aware of is that basically after this, uh, the murder of his wife and, and um, son, uh, he uh, was it was basically found out that he hired a distant cousin to come and murder him on the side of a South Carolina highway, and uh, and basically the the cousin missed and he gr <laughs> grazed his head, and, and the prosecution's theory is that. He had basically a ten million dollar life insurance policy on himself, and that was going to go to his son Buster, which I do believe was going to, uh, you know, be able to sort of, uh, you know, shield Buster from any sort of uh, repercussions from the law firm coming after all that mm -hmm. money that he had embezzled. So he had figured out a way to take care of the whatever remaining family he it's had. Best, strange, obviously, strange Buster theory. is, uh, is the favorite son. Buster's I mean, the good son. <laughs> that's what, I guess that's, that's what I'm saying. It kind of cuts both ways mm -hmm. if you're the, the the prosecution and the defense. I'm sure there was conversations about whether to talk about that because you go, well, how could this man who's willing to give up his life for his mm -hmm. son, mm -hmm. and then you turn around and go, yeah, he killed this other bastard. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, there's there's that's a strange dynamic. You know, well, I can I can see that once you've made a bunch of mistakes like this, that uh, you know you're not long for this world. I would I would not want to be around had had I done any of these things. I mean, it's definitely coming out that he's stole all this money from clients. Sure. And if I had engaged in this stuff, I yeah, I would I would not necessarily want to be here anymore. So right. I can see well, why somebody, you know once you're in that state, anybody who is, I mean, you're basically in a suicidal state, uh, even though you're not doing it yourself. Uh, that person's state of mind is, uh, you know has overcome their will to live. Sean, you touched upon it there a few minutes ago. You said you had already made up your kind of mind. And I think that a lot of the people in the public out there have kind of done the same. They've kind of convicted him in the, you know, the court of public opinion. And uh, a lot of times the public has a difficulty with the idea of the fact that there are professionals out there, esteemed people, hardworking, good, honest lawyers out there that are uh, willing to, defend somebody that has these types of allegations so what is it i mean you do a lot of criminal defense and Did. Uh, you d you have done <laughs> a lot of criminal defense for the last eight years and you know in, in when you're defending somebody that you you know, feel like there's a there's a very strong case against how do you justify going and, and actually presenting a very strong case and actually arguing to to actually have this person uh acquitted i think the main thing is duty to your client mm -hmm. uh you know, no matter what, you have an absolute duty to represent that person's interest. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, our job is to look at a case objectively, uh, identify what, if the case was to go to trial, mm -hmm. you know, each piece of evidence, whether it would be favorable to the our client, unfavorable to them, or not relevant at all, um, and give them objective advice about what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, <laughs> our advice in cases where, we don't feel that we have a valid defense that will be believable or, per, you know, that we'll be able to persuade a jury about. Mm -hmm. And the evidence is overwhelming. 
our job is to try and convince our client that it's in their best interest for us to resolve this case in some other way but a trial. Right. Because often the penalty is far worse right. should yeah. you go to trial and lose. And, and, and you know, theoretically, uh, by our laws, it should not be, but it is. Correct. But, but in the real world, it is. That's the way it happens. Well, that's, that's you know, they, the, it used to be the term trial tax yeah. mm-hmm. um, that, you know, people went to trial and, and when they lost, they wasted the government's time and the right. judge's time and the court's right. time and they got taxed on it. Uh, how it's usually put, you know, um, to make it legal and, about cons- to say, yeah, and constitutionally and right. That, no, you're not being punished for going to trial and exercising your constitutional right to go to trial. You're just not getting the benefit uh, that you had or would have gotten if you had accepted responsibility early yeah. in and the shown process remorse. Type thing. Yeah, for what well, the, truth, the truth of it is, it's just mitigating damages from the prosecution. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, not, or mitigating risk, I should say. Sure, and uh, that's once they once the clients made that decision though, and you're unable to yeah. convince them. Uh, that you know a trial is not in their best interest. Right. We you he hired me or she hired me to to represent them and defend them and and keep the government to their burden, burden. Uh, of proving them guilty beyond mm-hmm. a reasonable doubt. So it's our job to uh, you know query all of the evidence to cross examine the witnesses uh, to mm-hmm. find the disparities in their uh, statements that they've made in the past versus statements that they've made in the. Uh, at trial, which are often different, you know, you'd be surprised, even cases that the evidence is overwhelming, how witnesses' statements will get more detailed and more damning of the mm-hmm. client, you know, mm-hmm. f- three or four years after the incident. Um, I don't know whether it's conscious or subconscious, you know, yeah. but the witnesses get on the stand and they're out, you know, they usually have a vendetta, uh, right? you know, a leg to stand or a, a dog in the fight in a, in a prosecution, mm-hmm. unless it's just a total unbiased witness that just happened to see something. So um, no matter what, you know, we were all trained, you know, the same way to use the laws sure. of evidence, uh, to use the, you know, the criminal justice laws, uh, the process laws, to exclude evidence, you know, mm-hmm. that may be prejudicial to our client if it's not legally admissible in a case, um, and to try and persuade a jury that uh either this person is innocent or the state has not proved their burden beyond a reasonable doubt in this case. Right. Um, and there's reasonable doubt reasons that you should doubt mm-hmm. uh, that this person is, is guilty or not. Right. And, th- and you'll see this in some of the footage we're going to show you from the actual trial. But for me, like it, uh, I, I, I didn't necessarily want to go to law school. But when I got there, I was very, very uh, uh, impacted by, um, the philosophy behind the law, because if you want to mm. know about a, a particular culture and what they believe, really, you look at their laws. And that sure. is the that is the way in which they treat people. In other words, you know, like a morally how they say, like, you can't have a civil society unless you put these types of people in in jail right. or unless you give everybody the chance to um, present their uh, defense in court as best as best they possibly well, can. It, it, that same Theory goes with with how um, you're always going to be wrong one way or the other. I mean that's just the, that's just the facts of life. Mm-hmm. And would you rather be wrong on putting somebody in jail or not putting somebody sure. in jail? And our system says yeah. we'd rather be wrong on not putting somebody in jail. That's right. Um, yeah. Which I think is the right thing to do. Absolutely. Uh, but so that that tells you you know like you said about our society. Yeah, so th- I, I'll say on this case I think yeah. that going back to Sean's point about. You break down the facts, and, and just from what I know, which is not a ton, mm-hmm. but it's, mm-hmm. it, it's, it looks overwhelming, I right. mean, against this guy. I mean, he's done a lot of bad things. So, like you said, how many counts? 90 counts? 90 counts of fraud. Okay. And, and well, well, let's say, I mean, he's what? It's probably in his 50s, 60s? I don't know. <laughs> it, let's say three stick. Mm-hmm. I mean, odds are you got 90. <laughs> yeah, yeah, You yeah. got a couple that are going to stick. So this guy's going to die in prison. Mm-hmm. With any type of plea, yeah, any type of plea, yeah. sure. Yeah. So that I know, I mean, he goes, yeah, I don't care what the evidence says, I got to try this thing. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what I imagine happened. Murda, I mean, says that he's like, sure. I'm not, I'm not mm-hmm. taking a plea. I'm, you yeah. know, the 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 smallest amount is 180 years mm-hmm. in in prison. Like, there's right. no way, right? Yeah, and and at least there's some chance, <laughs> you know, if you go to trial, <laughs> right? If you enter a right. plea, right? That's what I think. You know, like in Georgia, if you enter a plea to uh, murder, you know, the minimum that you can get 
is life in prison right. with the possibility of parole. Right. Um, which, you know, that's what, you know, kind of really backs up our system because we have lots of people that just insist on going to trial for that exact reason. That right. If I plea... I'm going to prison got forever. Got no chance. If I lose, I'm going to prison forever. Right. But there's a I got micro, a one percent chance. There's a microscopic <laughs> chance, maybe less, you know, far less than one percent that I may win. Uh, right. And you know, once... OJ's living to tell about it. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like you touched upon it before, but and I and I could say that I know which Supreme Court justice said it. I'll just make one up. Okay. Because that's but, what some. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, third third yeah, so, so. marshal yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> stated that it's better that nine guilty men go free than one innocent man be convicted and go to jail. Right, and that's the basis for behind sort of how we establish the burden of proof that's required on the criminal side. On yep. the criminal side, exactly, and and that is um, part and parcel of of what the defense attorney's responsibility is. You are not necessarily representing the guilty person. What you are doing is representing the integrity of the system that you. You can't just have a state that is incredibly powerful. It's got unlimited resources to uh, develop evidence. Hell, to uh, tell the truth. Yeah, yeah, to, yep. yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> to and and to, they have authority as the as the state to actually present as an authority of what the actual truth is. And you have to have something that counterbalances that, and it re- requires somebody like a defense attorney to come in and present as best they can the defense. In, even in the light of sort of great uh, sort of evidence uh, so that, that that one innocent man will go free. And, and people would, well, you know, I hadn't done much criminal work. I, I try, I never really have enjoyed it, but, you know, I've heard people ask all the time, well, how could you represent blah, 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 whatever. Most of the time you're not doing this, but if you have a situation like this, the answer to that is, I'm not, you know, we are not the trier of fact. We're not the deciding fact. We're not the judge, right? We present the evidence. The other side presents the evidence, but we don't decide anything. Sure. We, we, the decider of, of what happens are the people or our, mm-hmm. our you know, neighbors. So that, that's how I look at it as well is, you know, everybody gets, needs to have somebody be able to speak for them and then, you know, the cards fall how they fall. Well, and, and my belief is that our, you know, justice system, at least the adversarial nature of it, is is something that is designed at getting to the truth yeah, and uh, works. You know, it's the best system that I think is in the world. Um, and the result of it, you know, if you look, is, you know, 98% of cases do not go to trial. Right. Uh, because the adversarial system gets together, the prosecution and defense looks at the case objectively, realizes what their strengths and weaknesses are, and they come up to a conclusion. You know, the defense might say, I'm screwed. I need to go, you know, get you the best plea bargain we can. (laughs) Uh, Or the prosecution might say, this ain't the best case. How about we offer him a much lesser charge, you know, and probation. You know, stuff like that happens all the time that makes the system work. And obviously, risk is involved in that. So we do have people, I'm sure, that uh, benefit greatly by getting a much reduced sentence, even though they may not have done it because they're scared if they went to trial on the greater thing, right. Uh, that they might get much more time. Right. Yeah. This this, this kind of case, which is, that's why it grabs the national attention is, Mm -hmm. is this, this is an outlier. This is not. Yeah. 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 And uh, just to go back to what Chase said about the Thurgood uh, Marshall quote, if that actually came from him. It didn't. It did <laughs> not. It, it did not at all. <laughs> it did not um, at all. I actually used something very uh, uh, close to that in my cross-examination of, of any police officers or, mm-hmm. you know, chief investigators mm-hmm. on cases. Um, and I would say, you know, because sometimes that's all you have is mm-hmm. sure. just criticize their investigation. That's all you got. Um, you know, not a real defense. And I say, you know, you would agree with me that it's far more important for us to investigate, to exonerate the innocent uh, than it is to convict, you know, the guilty. And they automatically, absolutely. I, yeah, I would yeah, agree yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. Then I say, okay, well, let's talk about the investigation that you did to exonerate, you know, somebody that's innocent. Right. And start going through things in the investigation that, you know, they did not they do. missed. That mm-hmm. could have potentially in, incriminated my client even more or, or sure. have, exonerated you know, exonerated him or, or give mm-hmm. you know some doubt so that's sure. uh 
a key thing that I, I harp on well, any time that I'm cross-examining a well, police Well, Sean, it's funny that you mentioned that because that is actually part and parcel of some of the key points from the Alex Murdoch trial Look that we're going to go over today. We got Look five. at that so segue. So if you would, uh, D'Angelo, uh, <laughs> could you bring up our clip one? What we're going to see here is basically both the uh, uh, attorneys— we're going to start off with Creighton Waters, the, the prosecution, highlighting some of the especially important evidence to consider in the case. And then we're going to go on to, to how uh, Alex Murdoch's um, defense team uh, responded. At 8, 44, and 55 seconds, Paul recorded a video. He was down in the kennels because he had been talking to a friend of his, and you're going to hear from this friend, because his friend's dog was in the kennels and they thought there was something wrong with the tail. And Paul was recording a video of it to send to his friend. 8.44 and 55 seconds. And on that video, and you'll see that video, and you'll hear from witnesses that identify Paul's voice, Maggie's voice, Alex's voice told anyone who would listen he was never there. At 8.44 and 55 seconds, there's a video. The evidence will show that he was there. He was at the murder scene with the two victims. And more than that, just over three minutes later, 8.49 and one second, Paul's phone locks it's important to talk about sort of uh, what uh, Alex Murdoch has claimed to have happened here. So he claims that the wife and the son had went, gone down to the kennels and that he stayed back to play on his phone, watch TV, and took a nap. And how around. far? I mean, how far are we talking here? I'm talking about a hundred yards. Maybe. Okay, All right. probably less, probably about forty or fifty yards from gotcha. the actual home. Okay, they went down there at in, in right around eight forty. They had had dinner earlier, and and uh, the evidence is that. Maggie showed up and went straight to the kennels, okay, and left her car running. Um, that's 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 an aside, but still. So this this video was taken at eight. But he's claiming that they got there and ate a nice dinner, mm -hmm. and, and then, then they went down to the okay. to they the kennels being the wife and Maggie child, Maggie and Paul. Right? She wouldn't have driven unless she's like going to get something from there that she can't carry and drive back up to the house. But anyway, maybe she had a 50 pound bag of dog food. Okay. She maybe had she had a sprained thank, ankle. Thank, thank you, Sean. Defense attorney. Chairman. So, uh, he claims he sat there on his phone and then went to visit his mother. When he woke up, went to visit his mother who has Alzheimer's. And this is important in that he would not have been there between eight 40 ish. They were on stand. Right. That's to it. 10, <laughs> to 10, 20, to 10, uh, like Oh seven. Uh, it was commented on that, you know, the, one of the uh, medical experts talked about how Alzheimer's patients are a lot worse at in the evening than it is they are during the day. And it'd be very odd to go, to sure. choose to go and visit somebody uh, in the evening. But regardless, he claims he came home at, at, at 10. And what the prosecutor is pointing, <laughs> <laughs> pointing out there is that there was a Snapchat video uh, actually recorded by Paul at 844 um, regarding... Uh, the dog's tail, and by a friend, you know, a family friend named Rogan, uh, who owned the dog, and and in the background, Rogan later came on the stand and testified that he heard 100 percent that that was Alex's voice at 8:44 in the background. Now I got a question, Sean. Isn't I, I don't know the criminal rules nearly like I know civil. What kind, How do you get that in of somebody saying? Obviously, they can't. Say this is definitively him. Mm -hmm. How does that come in? Some if I if I have a tape and it's just your voice and I'm your friend and I just sure. how, how how does that come in? Something I don't like that just goes to the the weight of the evidence, not the admissibility. Okay, um, you would obviously through uh, that particular witness, they would have to establish that that witness knows Alex Murdoch and to build known him for years and to all build, that yeah to build his credibility with the jury so the jury believes it more i got you how long have you known him how long did you spend around him you know stuff like that um you've talked to him before you build that foundation so that when the jury hears the statement that that's right. his voice it's up for them to decide whether or not they believe that witness or not mm -hmm. um it's not you know scientific you know like we have a 
a voice writing sample that yeah. says absolutely this is his voice. It's just you know uh, authentication by a, a live witness. Gotcha. Right, and and the jury gets to consider the bias that there may be in, involved, and sure. the, and that person's particular credibility. If that person has got a long laundry list of fraud charges, and you know they're a drug addict, and uh, got you know a mental uh, disabilities or whatever, they're gonna not credit that 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 uh, testimony a, a, as much. But I think what's important there is that they're actually relying on some pretty hard established evidence that's going to be incredibly difficult to sure deny. <laughs> especially once they have raised this alibi uh that he wasn't there at all um and just for you know everybody no, I, i'm i'm uh, that did they bring that into the court or did was that outside of the court because i that? the alibi that he wasn't there at all normally an alibi is going to be established in advance right uh, normally there's going to be a request well, for th- you to provide I thought An Chase alibi. had said that the that had changed that his his defense they timeline. Can, they can. Uh, okay. The the mm-hmm. main thing is you know most places will there'll be a motion filed if you intend to use the defense of alibi to let us know in right. advance because sure. the state should have the ability to you know track that down and you know uh, just like a confirm witness. it or deny it yep. type thing. Um, and an alibi is, you know, the impossibility of this person being able to have committed this offense because they were not at that time and place when the, ac- you know, it's actual a, it's in law happened. school for y'all folks out there. It's called an affirmative defense. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> that means affirmatively. You have to submit it. It is over. <laughs> so, so absolutely. You know, first of all, it's, you know, Chase mentioned that this dog kennel is in relative close proximity to the house. Uh, it's, it's. You know, in my mind, hard for me to believe that Alex Murdoch would have left the house to go visit a uh, his family member, uh, his mother, um, and not have been able to see them at the dog kennels. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, obviously, when you have this video that comes out that you have a witness that, you know, we don't know whether or not the jury will believe or not, mm-hmm. uh, says that's his voice. So, obviously, he was at the dog kennel with them. Mm. Yeah, and D'Angelo, I actually brought a couple of pictures uh, from the actual case, some of the exhibits. If you could pull up some of the uh, f- the actual exhibits of the property where this occurred so we can show. Yes, this is the, I believe, the home, the actual home there at the Monell property. Scene. That's just a little we can get away That's spot. just what I would imagine would be on a 17-acre okay. South Carolina farmhouse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this is this is the shed, some of the attached properties there. Um, showing where the dog kennels were and where they were found. They so were the actually, black vehicle there is. I think that's a police officer's vehicle okay. in, that, in that particular shot. So the, there's the home, and the actual kennels are located right behind the home. They they're they're actually you want to talk about how close they are. Yeah. They're covered up here by huh. the home from this particular shot. And, and that I, back back uh, in between the little V in the house mm-hmm. is that kind of where they are? Kind of yeah. Yeah, that's pretty close. This is basically the uh, uh, diagram of where um, the bodies were all found. So, uh, if you, the home is going to be basically to you know basically up here above the screen, and we're talking about maybe about twenty or thirty yards from the actual house. It looks like the uh, son's body was found there near next to a storage room, as you can see, and uh, the wife's body was found. Um, on the outside. So there. basically in the backyard. In the backyard. The defense basically says he had no motive to kill his wife and and, um, and son, and, the, and they put forth uh, uh, basically that defense that, that he uh, is a victim of somebody that uh, basically took it upon themselves to come and seek retribution for the death of a young woman that Paul has been accused of actually causing in a uh, boating accident that occurred some months before this. He was uh, currently being investigated for these uh, charges. He was apparently drinking in behind the wheel and uh, killed a young woman. And um, during his interview with SLED and the investigators regarding this uh, murder, he basically explained that there's been some threats out there uh, towards the family, that he'd actually been punched and attacked in public. And most of them have been benign, but but he credited them. He suspected them to have done this. Uh, it's interesting to note that that there were two guns that were used, um, an AR-15 and a shotgun. That is strange. Um, so that there would appear to be have been two shooters, or at least one shooter that used two guns. 
Um, Where was Buster at when this took place? That's a good question. Just, just curious. Who's Buster? This Buster's is the, the older the, son that's going to inherit son, the money. The good son. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just wondering. I mean, I, <laughs> well, what's interesting to me is that an actual shotgun was used. So the, uh, the actual identifying... The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I identifying mean, the actual uh, the rifling sort of... You know, on a rifle, you yeah. can actually identify oh, sure. the, the markings and say that that came from that rifle. The shotgun, you're not going to be able to do the same thing. Uh, they have not found the AR-15 that was used, and they believe that the shotgun was used actually came from the Murdoch's home. That's problematic. Uh, very problematic. But Alex uh, was had a myriad of problems. So Alex is just hanging out with his son at the dang dog kennel, and then he just shoots him. Uh, five minutes before uh, their phones, both the mother, Maggie, and Paul's phones basically sure. go silent basically forever, so nobody answers calls nobody answers text nobody returns text. So nobody def- does the defense anything. that we have going is mm-hmm. in that five minutes mm-hmm. not only did he leave alex mm-hmm. left he left sometime before that's what he's claiming okay but but the evidence shows never otherwise down all there. right yeah, yeah. so let's say he leaves so we got a five minute period where somehow he leaves getting gets in a car goes and sees his ailing mother mm-hmm. and the shots were fired mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. In that amount of time, mm-hmm. I, I, that's that's well. That's well, you, well, you, well, you see that they, they knew he was home. And they were frightened of Alex, and they were waiting in the woods, waiting for him to leave so that they could take out Paul. And the mother was just kind of like so that's, a, a, a that's sat- theory. Yeah. I got you. See, and that that defense might be a little more compelling mm-hmm. had he not then went the extra step mm-hmm. and hired the you know distant cousin to you know, go ahead and take me out yeah i mean I think it's, that's anytime that's oof. a that to me screams i'm out of control i'm scrambling for some type of control in my mm-hmm. life and basically throws all your credibility out of the sure. window yeah. to me uh when you go through that it's a, it's the same as the the murders in evans the, right. with the you know, Absolutely. So this may also shed a little bit of light on on his behavior. Okay, uh, in that during the investigation of these financial crimes that occurred at his firm, he was confronted about these by the basically one of the his colleagues, and I think it was the office manager, or maybe one of the other attorneys that was managing the trust accounts for him. Uh, a couple of days before this murder occurred, she confronted him. Right. And uh, he had to come clean to one of his longtime friends, one of his best friends that he practiced personal injury law with and had basically had to explain that he uh was committing all these uh you know you know crimes taking uh, uh attorney money and had involved him in a case in which there was a seven hundred thousand dollar set of like basically attorney's fees and uh this lawyer had actually put one hundred ninety two thousand dollars of his own money back into his own trust account because the money that alex sent him was uh, one hundred ninety two thousand dollars right. short of the actual thing, and so he confessed to him that he had actually committed all these crimes, and it was because that he uh, had been addicted to opioids mm. for the last twenty years. Now, when you tell me that somebody's committed a lot of crimes, they're probably going to go to jail, going to lose a lot of money, lose their entire life, and they're a drug addict. Um, odd behavior, extreme behavior, sounds almost normal. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and 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 folks at home for. Uh, you know, since I handled the money, uh, a trust account is an account that's essentially owned by the state. Mm-hmm. And if you want to get in trouble as a lawyer, mess up your trust account mm-hmm. because you don't own that money. You don't mm-hmm. have a right to that money mm-hmm. and that money gains interest, which the state collects. Um, but if you co-mingle funds, mm-hmm. you will be disbarred and you will go to prison. Mm-hmm. So the trust account is is we have a duty to protect the trust account, mm-hmm. and so he's commingling funds and stealing from a trust account, which is as a civil attorney, that is the number one thing you cannot do mm-hmm. ever. And it's easy way, you know, for even more of a layman, money that we receive from insurance companies for the benefit of our client, we deposit into that account. It's like an escrow account. It just sits there until we're ready to disperse it to the people that is due, uh, the clients, uh, medical providers, insurance companies mm-hmm. that are involved in the case, uh, our attorney's fees off of the case. So, you know, $50,000 comes in, we pay $50,000 out, and it's their always a trust zero. account for yeah. that client goes to zero. But if you're, ne- and I understand the, the plight of the friend, um, if you're 190000 in the hole, like if we are a cent 
in the hole in the mm-hmm. trust account. The There's Georgia bar is coming. South Carolina's coming. And I'm talking within <laughs> and days. An internal an investigation. An internal <laughs> investigation. It can yeah. be just that you know, a check was written with a cent wrong. You know, it doesn't matter. So if I was working on a case with someone and they said, hey, uh, and they sent me a check, and I have $192,000 missing from the trust account, mm. I might kill that son of a bitch myself. <laughs> <laughs> I could have stopped this from the get-go. <laughs> well... Uh, we don't want that. We don't condone that. Uh, <laughs> for 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 prospective lawyers out there, sure, yeah. that is crucial. The trust yeah. account has to be right. If your trust account isn't right, you can't practice. Well, you and can't. this kind of goes to show you that you know what we we hadn't really talked about uh, that much the the power that this particular family had yeah. in mm-hmm. that area. Mm-hmm. You know that a you know an actual lawyer, uh, you know, a grown adult practicing, you know, probably for many years mm-hmm. didn't immediately report. turn around and report this, yeah. you know. Well, um, it's not just him being sure. a, a prominent attorney. His family had actually been the district attorney for like five generations, I want to say, mm-hmm. in that county. And so by sure. doing that, you had established a, a, a basically a dynasty and generational wealth uh, that garnered a lot of respect in that in that particular community and made makes all this stuff a little bit more egregious considering he was given you know a lot of trust and a lot of power and in the way in which he he ultimately appears to have definitely abused it when it comes to um how he treated client funds this is I'm, this has set the gingers back 50 years oh <laughs> 50 years that's like, uh, the, reed's hot take the gingers <laughs> are gonna suffer well let's move on to only the second part of the first uh highlight of the of the trial <laughs> this would be the defense's uh response uh, into the opening statement witness say that their relationship maggie and alex's relationship were anything other than loving you can hear about how they went to a baseball game the weekend before you can hear about their relationship you're going to see texts and emails indicating a loving relationship. Paul, the apple of his eye. You're going to see a video somewhere between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, the night of the murders, with Paul and Alec riding around looking at some trees they planted. It's a Snapchat. Paul sent to other people because the trees were not planted very well. They were cantilevering over. They're laughing. They're having a good time. That would be about an hour before the Attorney General says he swatted them. The gases from that shot literally <coughs> exploded his head like a watermelon hit with a sledgehammer. All that was left was the front of his face. Everything else was gone. His brain exploded out of his head, hit the ceiling in the shed, and dropped to his feet. Horrendous, horrible, butchering. So to find Alec Murdoch guilty of murdering his son, you're going to have to accept that within an hour of having a extraordinarily bonding, you can see it in the Snapchat, that he executes him in a brutal fashion. That was the defense's response um, to the opening. And one of the things, of course, they're just pointing out the relationship uh, between the father and the son and the nature of the actual murders themselves and what it would actually take to do something like that Mm -hmm. to your son. Um, uh, Well, I think they're trying to shock the conscience of the the jury Mm -hmm. because a normal person... Us three sitting here, yeah. all of y'all out there watching and listening, yeah. you go, there's no way you could do that to your child. Mm-hmm. But some people are crazy. Uh, you know, so, but that's what he's doing is, mm-hmm. is going, he, he wants to make it gruesome. Mm-hmm. Normally, I would think a defense would. Normally, the that opposite. would be, the, be the, the prosecutor, you know, doing trying that. to inflame the jury right. about how horrible this was. But you're right. the only defense is like, this is so bad. So a father bad. Couldn't do a this. father couldn't do it, no matter right. what. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, usually a lot of times, and Victor says all the time, you can tell ba- basically by the opening statements which way the jury is going to go. In this particular case, there's so much sort of like data 
and um, as far as the, the cell phone data, and uh, there's going to be so much testimony. And based on what I actually saw of the opening statements, I, I don't really think that that they're going to decide. Ba- they shouldn't decide, and I don't think they're going to decide based on what they saw in the, the opening statements. So that is a that is a, a, a good argument to a to a normal yeah. person, an average person, that a part, you know a father could not do that to their right. son. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's a, that is a decent argument. And there was an alibi, of course, that he says that he went to see his mother. Now, during that time, his phone records do show that he was, where, you know, where his mother was, you know, that, that she, he had, did make the trip right around that time, uh, 8.59, to go there. Okay, well, he very well could have killed his family and then gone. Left. Right, Absolutely. left, exactly. But, but um, having said that, uh, one of the first things that always gets introduced in these uh, types of cases and these investigations is the actual 911 tape. And uh, we'll let you listen to that and see if you think that this is the type of uh, sort of reaction a person would actually have um, coming home uh, to see this kind of... Uh, well, and, this, and, and this is what, 10, 10 30, supposed, something like that? Whatever. 10 o'clock at night. Okay. Yeah. And just to go real quick back to what you were talking about, the... What we're talking about, the defense attorney trying to show a lack of, is is motive. Mm. Um, and, you know, motive, there doesn't have to be a motive for there to be a crime. Exactly. Um, you know, you could commit murder without actually having a motive. But it's always a heck of a lot stronger yeah. of a case for a prosecution to be able to show that, some type of motive. And it's always going to be something that is attacked by the defense to try and show Absolutely. He had no reason to ever do something like this. And that's not part of the code. Correct. You don't have to hit that on the checklist, but a jury wants it. Absolutely. But, yeah. So if we could, let's go ahead and play that 911 video and we'll listen and decide for ourselves. Oh, an emergency. <laughs> this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to stand this immediately. My wife and child just got badly. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Sir? You said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Yes, sir. 4147 Moselle Road. Stay on the line with me, okay? Yes, sir. Stay on the line with me, okay? Okay. Con County Communications. Collison, I have an Alex Murdoch on the line. Call us from 4147. Yeah, ultimately it's going to be up to the jury, but were we on that jury? Would you say that that is a... A nine one one call that shows some legitimate shock and uh, all at what they're actually looking at. I think I could look at it and view it either way. Yeah. Uh, initially, I when he was talking, he sounded genuinely, mm-hmm. you know, uh, distressed, mm-hmm. you know. And then as the call went on, the more you think about it, and obviously us knowing more information about it, we mm-hmm. start analyzing. Well. Is he really distressed or is he just acting distressed? But mm-hmm. uh, initially, the, the first couple you know, uh, of seconds of the call and his talking with the male dispatcher, he seems genuinely distressed to me. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> I'll kind of... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've always been very cautious to judge somebody on how they react to... Very extreme things. Mm -hmm. Um, When I was a kid, I had a friend who lost his dad, and he went and played basketball like two days later, right? And no foul play, obviously, you know. And everybody's giving him help because he's playing basketball. Everybody deals with things differently. Um, Sometimes, Chase, sometimes your face doesn't match your emotions. You know, we've talked about that. Um, So uh, for me... I don't think you can get, gain anything good or bad from the way you react because you don't know how you would react until you're in that situation. Sure. sure. And I also think that let's say he did it. He's gone for some time. You come back and then you see it. You can, I, if it could, I, yeah, it, it, it could it, invoke it, the it, same emotions. It could absolutely. invoke the absolute same emotion. So I, I don't really – love that like trying to gain what well, how should you react how yeah. should how how should i react if my child was killed i, I don't know i yeah. would never know yeah um so i just don't I, I don't like judging that kind of thing yeah I, I i i agree with you to a degree but in that just imagine if if instead of that he'd said 
Hello, my name is Alex Murdoch. I've just come home, and uh, my wife and kid are dead in the, uh, you know, dog kennels outside. My son's been shot. My wife's been shot. They both, you know, they're, they're both dead. You know, and I need y'all to come get the police or whatever. So you would think I disagree. something's I, up. I still disagree with you there mm -hmm. because I have an analytical brain, and it is either very emotional or not, and that might be too much for me to process, process mm -hmm. and it just turns into I have to call. Robot. I have to, yeah, mm -hmm. and so I'm not feeling anything, mm -hmm. and I might feel it way later. I, just, I, I find that difficult, and I, in all cases, mm -hmm. uh, car accidents, sure. civil cases, criminal cases, mm -hmm. your reaction in an extreme situation is Shouldn't not be the really who you are, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and I find that tough, and it jury jurors use it all the time um but it, it, i don't think that it's a great way to judge what's going on that's yeah. purely my opinion and reed mm -hmm. you're you're great with with movies so you'll probably know exactly what movie i'm talking about with the guy that he calls uh the 911 and tells him that you you know he's got that real you need to call go ahead and bring the coroner uh -huh. And they're like, well, should we send the ambulance? And he's like, no, that second blow knocked his head clean off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're, part, you're, you're talking about, we're talking about one little piece of evidence in the case. Sure. And it's, in, it's a ba very sensational piece of evidence because it is, you know, the first statement after the murder of his wife. And, and you would want to know what, you know, a husband, especially if they're suspected, would, would sound like in that particular situation. But this is part and parcel of the amount of evidence or the one little piece, one little brick in the wall of the evidence that has to be presented in order for a jury to get to that beyond a reasonable doubt um, uh, type decision. And for Reed, that wouldn't be very impactful. For me, it would be to a degree. I would I'd take it with a grain of salt, understand what I understand about people. I mean, one of the exceptions to the hearsay rule, you know, hearsay basically is statements made outside of court. And you can't basically bring those into court and, and, and use them as evidence for the truth of the matter or whatever you're asserting was actually actually occurred. And don't and right? don't get into the exceptions of that. We'll spend well, this, is, <laughs> well, 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 this this is in one of the exceptions. Oh, Chase, it's, it's, if we get into the exceptions of hearsay, we'll be here for five hours. I know, hours. but the people people need to I understand. Know. Like if you if you understand like the basis of it, it's like when you're scared and something's happening uh, right in front of you. Oh my God, he just shot him. You know, you just saw something and it just came out of your mouth. The courts have recognized that there is what they call an indicia of reliability in those statements. When someone actually is so excited, they don't even have the ability to uh, formulate a lie in that second, in that moment. And these are, this is one of the, the, the exceptions where you say, I can bring the statement in because it has certain a certain level of reliability. And that reliability is that this person was so shocked from what they just seen that that those statements are most likely true or at least should be considered when it comes to the issue, the main issue in the case. So that, sure. that, that is the basic way to sure. explain it. Present the, sense, uh, impression, yeah. or excitement. And then, it, and then it, still know, goes, it still goes to how the jury views it. And like you said, I wouldn't view it very heavily, but another mm -hmm. juror would. Now, mm -hmm. There's other evidence that I've seen that y'all have presented so far that I'm going, this son of a bitch is guilty. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's just my opinion. But mm. that part doesn't sway me. Right. It, but but it might sway somebody else. And so as sure. trial attorneys, we have to do all of that. Mm. And I'll also add this. And, and we've had it on a couple of occasions with some civil cases. The, we all have biases on everything we do. But the general population has a bias against attorneys when it when they are charged with something, sure, sure, it is. I, I do, Life. I do right now. Sure. I'm saying, well, this guy knows the rules. <laughs> he, there's two guns. Mm -hmm. What? Maybe he was planning it. But mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when it was a normal non-attorney, right. you might not think that way. Mm -hmm. but this guy has been an attorney for years, mm -hmm. so you're going. Well, he knows what's going on. He's setting this thing up. So you have a bias already built in of. Well, he knows the rules. You know, it, in, it, anything. I mean, same anything. thing with, you know, police officers, you know, that would be accused of a, a horrific murder or something like this. You right. Know, anytime there's missing evidence, you know, there's that bias. He must have of, stole it. He must of have course, been. there's no, you know, <laughs> DNA or footprints. He knows exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on to one of the uh, exam cross examinations in the, in the case. Uh, one of the first responders that actually show up. And uh, we're going to. 
basically go to the defense attorney and how he's, um, I believe, questioning the uh, first responder and what he actually observed about um, DNA or blood actually on Alex Murda and his, sort of his, his initial impressions. I approached toward him. I could see the male victim laying on the ground to my left as well as the female victim on the ground to my right. Um, the male victim was close to a small shed in the dog kennel on the left. It was a large deal of blood that had pooled around his body. Um, same thing for the female victim on the right. Uh, also a large amount of blood around her body. His immediate reaction was to start telling me about an incident that had happened with his son uh, with a boating accident. With the boating accident? Yes, sir. Had you asked him anything about that? I did not. So this is important because the son's head was gone. Yeah. It was earlier tonight. Uh, I, I don't know the exact time, but okay. I left. I was probably gone an hour and a half from my mom's, and I saw them about 45 minutes before that. Okay. I rode around with Paul for two hours this afternoon in the, in the pickup truck. That's your son, Paul? Somebody go to Yes, sir. They, they've already checked them. They did check them? Yes, sir. It's official that they're dead? Yes, sir. That's what it looks like. When you observed these victims, was it obvious that they had injuries incompatible with life? Yes, any reasonable person that came upon those bodies would have come to a conclusion that they were deceased. This is the firearm you brought from inside the house? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I went get, and this is a long story. My son was in a boat wreck a, a few months back. He's been getting threats. Most of it's been benign stuff we didn't take serious. Okay. Um, you know, he, he's been getting, like, punched. Um, I know that's what it is. And as we talked about a little bit before, that what Murdoch was referring to in that particular clip, it was, you know, what happened. Uh, her name is Mallory Beach. She died in an accident where Paul was allegedly drinking and driving behind the wheel of a boat. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit where the hillbilly in me comes out. <laughs> like, I immediately thought, when this happened, when I heard it on the news, I said, Sounds like, uh, you know, some, some good old boys just so took care of business. A little yeah. vigilante justice. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, I've, I've had, you know, I, my family comes from North Georgia. I have, fam, you know, family that in a situation like that uh, would not think twice about, well, I can tell about you, I mean, doing the time. If I'm from, you know, that town and they own mm -hmm. the town and mm -hmm. there's no justice being done. Right. Yep. I'm, I, you know, if it's my mm -hmm. child. Yeah. I'm probably going to prison because yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going on. I'm going on. You turn him loose. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, that's one of the, the viable sort of defenses or whatever. And, but it's interesting that the prosecution brought up, did you ask him about that? Yeah. I think it's strange. Now, like I said, I don't really rely so much on excited utterances. The exception is, is probably most lawyers do, but that – Mm -hmm. is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I think that you react differently, uh, everybody will, to a, a, a disaster. Um, and I can even get around him with the check in the polls. If I saw my son and his, his, his head was blown off, mm -hmm. um, I might say I checked the pulse because they're asking me questions on 911, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just freaking out, right? Mm -hmm. This crosses that line for me mm -hmm. in that I'm not thinking about – Mm -mm. how this happened i'm thinking why? about or why i'm thinking about what just happened like what my poor son my poor son my poor wife like this is i'm not going i'm not giving motive like you were talking about sean sure. i'm not trying to think of motive i'm i'm trying to deal with what's happening and <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm probably not doing it well no um, but that one is damning to me if mm -hmm. I'm a juror, that one's damning. Yeah, because he's immediately trying to shift blame. And he's a first responder, the first person in the scene, and all, and one of the first things he tells right. him. And he's asking, is his son dead? His son's brain is on the ground, and right. the only thing left is the front part of his face. And he has apparently checked for a pulse. Right. Like I said, I can get around checking for pulse. I can't. I if can't. You, if you don't have a head. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. I can get around. Je it, it, you it, always got to think that no matter what statements are made, the prosecution is always going to try and paint them in a fashion that is beneficial to them. Sure. And the defense is going to have to, you know, is going to try and, you know, refute that or paint them in a way that's, you know, beneficial. So let's, you know, that's why we tell people all the time not to talk to the police if you're accused of something. <laughs> uh, because no matter what, 
Mm. Something you say will be used somehow against you. Good or bad. I mean, so, you know, a question to a person that is in this heightened state that this has just happened, whether or not he did it or whether Mm. somebody else did, he's in a heightened state of emotion. Right. Um, And you ask them, well, did you touch anything? And you say, well, well, I did. I, I, I checked for a pulse, you know. Was he saying I checked for the pulse on my wife? Right. Was he saying I checked for the pulse on both of them? You know, just simple things like that. But when you make those statements, you know, yeah. certainly it allows. he was playing the victim. Mm-hmm. It allows both sides to try and interpret them their own way, explain to the jury what those statements meant or how they, you know, uh, fit their theory of the case sure. or the other theory of the case. Yeah. And but the the... the it, it makes sense to me that he would say, I checked for a pulse because he wanted to explain away any blood residue that had actually occurred, like that he'd had on him, that he was down there. Okay. Because, you know, he, he claimed he was never down there until he actually came back. Sure. If uh, he didn't say he checked on anything, there was no reason why he, his fingerprints should have been anywhere. It's like on the thing. Well, I guess he could, it could have been there during the middle of the day. Like he could have been there. He was riding around in his truck for two hours. Yeah. But still, like as far as the blood goes and all that, you know that that explains a good uh, a good bit of that. And he's worried about whether or not there's blood on him still. Whatever precautions he may have taken, sure. If he, if he did that, but uh, we're going to go next to the actual um, prosecution's um, uh, cross examination. I think of Sergeant Green. Yep, and w- this actually well, you t- needed to really say that you said the prosecution's cross examination. Yeah, this is the prosecution's cross examination of they're Sergeant. Not, they're not cross examining him; they're direct examining. You no, know, nah, he was already on direct. I think. Oh wait, wait, no, 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 no. It would be in the defense's cross examination. Okay. Yeah. Said, yeah, it would be in the. Uh, what do you call it? Cross examination, prosecution, back. witness, redirect. redirect. Yeah, yeah. So this would be in the the defense's pros, uh, cross examination of uh, okay. Sergeant. This, Green. this is our last clip, Chase. We got we've been here forever. I'm enjoying it for real. Yeah. But it's gonna be a twelve hour more? show. We're, I'm gonna look here. Just send it to me, and I'll <laughs> yeah, cut it down. No, but no, I, got, I got, I got, I got one more clip. I gotta play. All right. All right. Mm-hmm. Sure. Wait, did you want to re-say that line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Just go ahead. And- hold okay. on, hold on. All right. There you go. Thank you, thank you. So this brings me to my next point. Sean touched upon it earlier and talked about the investigation. This, this is going to be the defense's cross examination of Sergeant Green. Standing inside the feed room, just inside that doorway was yeah. Deputy McDowell. Okay. Were you the president? Oh, is that your body cam? So you're watching him do it, right? That's, that's correct. Should he have done that? Stand where he's standing? Standing inside the feed room. It's part of the crime scene. We're all standing inside of the crime scene. Inside what? The crime scene. We are all standing in the same crime scene. I understand the same crime scene, but clearly you believe, based on discussion, and everyone in your unit believe, that the fatal shot was made where he basically standing, correct? That, in that area. Where we are all standing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is that procedure to walk around on top of an area where shots have been fired? If perhaps, and I think even in this, they're talking about tissue or brain matter laying there. Um, I mean, aren't you supposed to? You don't put anything on your feet. Okay. Yeah. This does show exactly what Sean mentioned yeah. before about question the actual investigation. There was body cam footage showing that one of the detectives was actually standing in the feed room, and there's a photo of that I'll show you, where uh, Paul actually was killed, and one of the detectives was actually standing in the crime scene. Is that actual sort of proper investigation protocol to go walking around in a crime scene without taking pictures? Absolutely not. (laughs) Uh, Obviously, you know, uh, first responders, you know, get to a scene, and, you know, they may actually have to, enter this crime scene and Mm -hmm. see these people and verify these people are, you know, have expired. Um, and then it's all about, you know, containment, um, and, you know, setting up a crime scene, uh, so that you can process the crime scene in a, in a manner that preserves the integrity of the evidence in that crime scene. Uh, just based on my knowledge Mm -hmm. and, and experience, you know, Some law enforcement agencies don't have the resources and training of others. Uh, So if you go to, you know, some small agency in South Georgia or small agency in, you know, rural South Carolina, they're not going to have the same 
knowledge, training, experience, resources, uh, and expertise that, you know, the Federal Bureau of Investigation crime scene unit sure. would have. So, yeah. I mean, I can see, I see what, you know, defense attorneys do, uh, and I've done it, you know, before as well. Um, but, you know, I haven't seen this whole cross-examination, so usually, you know, I try to establish that this particular person knows, mm -hmm. you know, this is how it's done, this is how it's done, this is how it's done, this is how it's right. done. You already know all this. Mm -hmm. And then go through, and you guys have the opportunity or have the resources to collect fingerprints, don't you? You know, you have multiple ways that you can do that. You have the resources to photograph, you know, footprints, don't you? Yes. And you, you had a camera there with you that day, didn't you? And you can look at, you know, tire tread and photograph those and do cast and impressions. Well, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Cause they all know generally that they can do that. Yeah. Um, and then you come back and start hitting them with, well, then why is everybody walking around, you know, standing on the, you know, on this on evidence, the crime you know, type yeah. stuff like that. So, um, it happens all the time. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, with, you know, the amount of resources that are dedicated to uh, law enforcement, uh, you don't always get a perfect investigation. And um, I think that that's uh, something that the prosecution has to do in, in closing argument is, is explain to them the faults of this investigation are faults that happen all the time, but they don't cause reasonable doubt in this mm -hmm. case based mm -hmm. on the overwhelming evidence right. and uh, in the defense has to do what they're doing and, and like we talked about it earlier um i mean that's kind of what our society's built on you you have to say well if this wasn't messed up it might have shown something different i mean we can agree with that you know so th you have to present that defense if you want to uh be a good attorney and a good advocate for your client because the state has the upper hand on you regardless of uh you know budget cuts and all that for the state mm -hmm. you're still behind the eight ball oh, i mean sure. you, yeah. you, you hire a private attorney he's going to do the absolute best that he can do but he has nowhere near the resources, the, the resources of mm -hmm. the state so you, you have to do that you yeah. have to so how could that have shaken out any differently so let's just imagine uh that the police had not gone walking in there that one of the first people that responded to the scene didn't go into that room so we know that we have the young man paul's footprints are going to be in there this is a dirt ground okay we know that the mother potentially could have been there we know alex could have his footprints could have been in there he had the shoes they could have matched shoes with the house so he could have been there yesterday the day before had it rained all that sure what if there were some very a uh, marked combat boot type footprints that had that were on that were in that feed size, room size 13 it's size 13 that went right <laughs> outside around where the wife's body was and had we not had 35 police officers walking around inside the crime scene we could have actually shown that type of evidence and and as implausible it may have seen again it goes back to that sure you know you know nine guilty should go free you know versus one going to jail that they shouldn't do it, but the, the last one is it's most interesting to me, and it's kind of all a buzz. The last little clip I'm going to play is most interesting, uh, in that because I, I, I know you guys probably haven't seen this, uh, but it's all a buzz on the, in, on the internet. It is alleged that he actually made a Freudian slip okay. in his actual uh, discussions with the uh, sled investigators there, uh, as he's describing what happened. And I want to know what you guys believe he said, number one, and two, whether or not you think it was a mistake or uh, uh, by the prosecution to kind of assert this, this 40 okay. slip. Uh, Let's play it. Please, Doug. Exhibit uh, 243 and up. It's, it's tough. <laughs> it's just so bad. It's so bad. All right. Back it up and play it in real time again, Doug. Real time. Or not, not easy. I know it's hard. And sitting here talking today is, is tough. <laughs> it's just so bad. It's so bad. All right. What did you guys hear him just say? 
it's just so bad. They did him so bad. I heard uh, it's so bad. I did it so bad. Okay. But your second question was, do I think the prosecution should have used that? Yeah. I think that they absolutely should not have used that mm-hmm. because you're clouding the issue. Mm-hmm. And and what I mean by that is clouding the issue it, is it, reasonable it, doubt. doubt. Exactly. <laughs> you have a mountain mm-hmm. of evidence, yes. a mountain of mm-hmm. evidence. Mm-hmm. You don't need to argue a Freudian slip. Mm-hmm. That is, sure. that is, you don't need that. Mm-hmm. All that, you're helping the defense. Mm-hmm. Because now, Sean and me are arguing in the jury yeah. room of going, well, I thought he said I did it so bad. You're thinking he said they did it so bad. Well, now we got an issue. Now yeah. we got a problem. If there's an issue. If there's an issue, if the innocent. glove doesn't fit. Yeah, you must have quit. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and it's interesting that that was played. Mm-hmm. Um. Because usually when I think about things as a prosecutor, at Mm -hmm. at least, Mm -hmm. um, there is things that I am going to not provide to the jury Mm -hmm. because it's a self-serving statement of the defendant. Mm -hmm. If I have, you know, defendant on trial and Mm -hmm. I was prosecuting that person, Mm -hmm. if he wants to get up and say that he didn't do it, Mm -hmm. I'd rather him get up and say that he didn't do it and give me the ability to cross-examine him. Mm-hmm. Well, he doesn't have to do that. Mm-hmm. So why would I then play his statement? Because mm-hmm. you don't have to. Right. Mm-hmm. And the they can't the defense can't introduce yeah. his statement either. Mm-hmm. Um, why would I introduce a self-serving statement of the defendant yep. that where he's claiming innocence and doesn't know anything about it? And then I rest my case, and then the d- defendant doesn't even have to get on the stand well, because he's already made his statement through sure. the— Right. Well, what they're saying is that he did make a statement, and they're saying the— that investi- that's a confession? The, the investigator said that he heard I. And see, so this is why I think it's so— That's, okay. that's, that's, that's absolute nothing. bullshit, yeah, bullshit. <laughs> because he would have arrested him right there. Yeah, well, I agree. So uh, he thinks it was a Freudian slip, okay? And this is why I think it's such an important— point to make is that credibility is king i don't care if it's civil i don't care if it's criminal Agreed, whatever 100%. It, right credibility is king and by taking that uh questionable piece of testimony and asserting that it's the truth okay you automatically put yourself at opposition of everybody that heard that and said they like 40 percent, 50 percent could have said and, i 50 and, chase on top said of they. That, and, and, and you're as a juror you're like who do I listen to? Who are the leaders yeah. in this courtroom? Is the prosecution right in their leadership or is the defense right in their leadership? And it's like, well, the prosecution tried to full, force some bullshit on me and saying, sure. hey, uh, they versus I. They're trying to say he confessed. Right. Well, I don't believe that. <laughs> if that's right? all they got. If that's yeah, all they yeah. got, then what, you know, I'm going to go over here. So and, I think it was a huge mistake I by too. the prosecution. And even if the, the yeah, it's a 60-40, you're 60 that say that, like I heard it, I mm-hmm. did it so bad, whatever. Mm. That's still a Freudian slip. That doesn't mean that you're confessing. That's right. I've said some stupid crap uh, in I, my life, and it, and it sometimes slips out, and I say mm-hmm, it incorrectly. Mm-hmm. That's not what I truly mm-hmm. believe or truly yeah. happened. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. wish that I had the time uh, just to go sit and watch these trials myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'd like to hear the entire tape. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, because obviously, any any police officer who's been through basic law enforcement training, certainly any investigator. Uh, who has investigative training in this type of things, there's going to be immediate follow-up questions. Mm-hmm. If if he really thought that this was a slip and that he just immediately, he confessed Said to me. I did him so it, bad. You're talking to me. Okay, well, explain that to me. I know that you feel bad about right. what you did. What you, you did. Know, you know, yeah, what let's happened. see how he responds. I mean, it's, it's just for them to come later and a police officer to actually testify mm-hmm. that, oh, yeah, I made a – I think I read it in the news that he said he made mm-hmm. a mental note of that. When, yeah. That for work. him not to yeah, act yeah. upon that yeah, or, or immediately all. call yeah. this a confession, so, is, like it, goes, it harms his credibility. It's, I was to say, it goes mm-hmm. back to Chase. It, it yeah. harms his credibility, which harms the case's credibility. And then it, I, I keep bringing this to the OJ thing. It goes to, well, if that cop's lying, all, all the cops are lying. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. it's that same thing as credibility. Yep. And so, like, I, 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 I didn't play this part of it because I wanted you guys to react to this because I think the defense is doing a good job. They're doing what they're supposed to in this particular case, and they're kind of highlighting that particular fact. So 
they have figured out a way, like you're not allowed to what they call bolster. So like if you've already asked and answered the question, sure. he asks this police officer, you know, did he say they or I, the police officer says I, I in my mind he says I, and then what he did was something interesting. It was an interesting tactic. Did you hear now they or I? I will still testify that my hearing, I hear I. Okay. Your Honor, we'd like to play it again at one third speed to slow it down. It's just the same. Thank you. Third speed. Foundation laid for who's manipulating it, how it's being manipulated. Uh, I think uh, obviously we have it in real time, but there would have to be some additional on that. At one third speed. And sitting is, is tough. It's just so bad. It is so bad. Did you hear they then? No, sir, I did not. Okay. All right, go ahead and start it. So he, he was able to, to actually read. Did you hear they then on that? Time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when that kind of thing happens mm -hmm. as a eyewitness mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. it, and this happens all the time, civil cases, anything, mm -hmm. people get so enamored with mm -hmm. what they have already testified mm -hmm. to. So it's sometimes better to go, I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Maybe he, but I, because I heard it they. Been they. It could have been they. But at the time, I, I heard, heard it I. as I. Mm -hmm. But when you say, when I when you hear that, and mm -hmm. when you say, yeah, I still hear I. Mm -hmm. I don't believe you've a damn thing. I don't believe a damn thing you've said yeah. the entire trial. Take yeah. the punch. Don't take, take the, the ass whipping. There you go. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what it. I've always said. And then, I mean, it, it's just. I have it, never it, heard that. It, no, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's really. And, and one of the, you know. One of the my favorite you know trials was actually with your dad, mm -hmm. um, and we it was a murder case, and we felt very strongly our client was not guilty whatsoever, and he was you know uh, rightfully defending himself, and there was a, a GBI Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Uh, this was a firearms expert knows absolutely everything about firearms. Um, <laughs> That's the water treatment plant. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. This, this, this is yeah. a case that happened shooting multiple people um, where the client was actually shot himself, too. Um, and we split up who was going to cross-examine who and everything. And Vic's like, you should definitely do the, uh, you know, the GBI, you know, expert. I'm like, absolutely. That's no problem. And the person, you know, gets up there when on the prosecution actually calls them and goes through how they are uh, – you know, an expert in mm -hmm. this, absolute expert. We do all these ballistics things. I'm an expert Glock armorer, which this is the type of firearm that was, uh, you know, in question that right. was used by the, uh, I guess, the deceased. Right. Um, and then, you know, on cross-examination, we went over all that again. I went over all that again, you know, and I reminded him, well, you're actually a scientist, right? You know, you don't have a dog in this fight. You work for the entire state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Um you were supposed to do scientific uh, research on whatever is asked of you based on your knowledge of ballistics and firearms and everything. And this was the firearm that had a, a magazine sticking out of the bottom of it about this long. Right. A handgun. Mm -hmm. A handgun that looked like it had a submachine gun magazine sticking it's, out of the bottom of it. It's what's called an extendo. Yeah, and I, I, I just <laughs> set the picture in front of him and I said, is, is this the, the magazine that comes with this particular firearm? Well, I don't know, sir. I said, well, this is a Glock, you know, Model 22, right? You're an expert in Glocks. You know, does it come with a 50-round magazine? <laughs> oh, I don't know, sir. I'm like, okay, well, what kind of firearm do you carry? Yeah. You carry a Glock, don't you? Isn't that issued to you by the state of Georgia? Well, absolutely. Well, what what came with yours? Right. Did you get a 50-round magazine? You know, it's just... Just say no. I mean, absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the jury starts laughing. They know that this guy is... 100% pro prosecution and trying to paint mm -hmm. a picture that is pro prosecution yeah. right instead of just saying what the yeah you know what, Common the, sense. what the evidence is yeah, yeah and, so, and so that that points to the fact that what what happened is is that particular witness became somebody with a dog in the fight they have an opinion about what happened here and they're going to say whatever's necessary to convict this guy and that destroyed 
his credibility, and it was 100% not necessary because they had tons of other evidence. It should have mm-hmm. never been actually sure. actually submitted that he made some sort of Freudian slip. The yeah. jury could have listened to that tape 50 times, and all 12 of them thought he said I, and that would have been fine. Let him listen to it. Don't, like, don't, don't try comment on it. to hang your don't hat comment on, on it. some sort of like wishy-washy 50-50 thing sure. when you have the burden of proof of beyond yeah. a reasonable doubt. If I if you introduced that, mm-hmm. I would just have played it mm-hmm. and had no questions. Moved on. Yeah. We may do a follow-up. We may have another sort of uh, uh, set of topics in between. I have there's one been, for you. There's been some, some a nursing scandal that's there been in the go. news, and we might, we might cover that in the interim. But uh, what did you hear? Did you hear I? Did you hear they? Um, you can they. Com- you can comment. You can comment below. Um, and again, thank y'all all for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time.